Hi, everybody. Good afternoon or morning or whatever time it is where you are. I'm really happy to be back this year again with one of the topics I really love sharing about, which is sociolinguistic language documentation. Uh, and also, please excuse me, I think I'm getting a little bit of a cold, so my voice is a little scratchy. Let me know if I need to go back and repeat anything. So let's just dive right in with a big question because we're kind of starting with a complex term already. What actually is sociolinguistics and what do we mean when we say sociolinguistic documentation? Well, let's let's try and pull apart this long word. Let's start with socio, which basically is the root word for anything social, anything that has to do with society. Uh, and one of the very most preeminent sociolinguists, Walt Wolfram, defines it this way. Language use symbolically represents fundamental dimensions of social behavior and human interaction. The notion is simple, but the ways in which language reflects behaviors can often be complex and I'm just going to write back in on this last slide, but if anybody wants to tell me where I got cut off, let me know. But yeah, let's let's just go back to this really, really simple definition of sociolinguistics. Um, can y'all hear me now? Is anyone having trouble hearing? Let me get a thumbs up if you can hear me. All right, seeing some thumbs up. Looks like I am audible. That's great. All right. So uh, going back to the really simplest definition of sociolinguistics, basically sociolinguistics is a field that looks at this simple fact. How we talk is a result of who we are and how we fit into society and vice versa, which means that how we fit into society and who we are are also shaped by how we talk in some ways. And this obviously, like if we go back to what Walt Wolfram says, this can be complex and subtle. There is no simple introductory sociolinguistics that can cover all of the ways that this shows up in our lives. So we could spend years and years talking about this, but today we're just gonna get a sort of introductory sample about ways that sociolinguistics and fit into and inform our language documentation work, or really how our documentation work can look at all of the awesome and nuanced and complex ways that our language use reflects and shapes the ways that we fit into society. So if we go way back, I know it was like five weeks ago, that feels like ages, uh, but our definition of language documentation from session one was creating a lasting multi-purpose record of a language. And I want to backtrack a little bit and revise that definition. And so I'm not actually, I'm not actually count contradicting Nicholas Himmelman who gave this definition. I am reflecting an update he made to his own definition. So originally we said creating a lasting multi-purpose record of a language. But let's update this to creating a comprehensive record of the linguistic practices characteristic of a given speech community. And again, that's very academic jargon, so let's unpack that. The first definition is talking about really just making a record of one language, 
however we want to define that. This other definition, our updated definition, is really more about looking at a given group of people, a community, and speech community has its own complex definitions in sociolinguistics, but basically, let's say, a group of people, a community, we want to make a record of how they use language, right? Their linguistic practices. What is distinctive about how this group of people use language? Because that is actually sort of the overarching goal of language documentation. And so this means if we update our definition this way, we don't have to really only focus on one language, right? Lots of communities are very multilingual. This also means we're not only looking at linguistic structure. We're not just looking at the language itself in a bubble isolated from everything else. This allows us to go beyond just kind of sounds and words and sentences and grammar. What we really want to document is what people do with language. All of the languages that they know and use, all of the varieties or dialects that they know and use, and how those language uses happen in their daily lives. And if we get really, really ambitious, we might even start trying to figure out why people use language in the ways that they do, which is really challenging and really interesting. And so this sort of brings us into documentation and how sociolinguistic concepts like these play in. And one of the things that sort of kicked off this, this formal study of sociolinguistic documentation in the early 2010s um, is the, the way that language endangerment studies kicked off language documentation as a field, uh, this acknowledgement that linguistic ecologies or these networks of relationships between languages and communities and different ways of using language, right? Language ecologies are usually more fragile and more endangered than languages themselves. Uh, and this was one of sort of the key arguments made by Dr. Tucker Childs and his colleagues in the 2014 paper that sort of really inaugurated the field of sociolinguistic language documentation. And this means that the clock is sort of ticking faster on these language ecologies um, and the pressures on them make them change and go away quicker. And so if you wanna document something that's really time sensitive, this is an important thing to consider. Uh, and so part of the reason that Dr. Childs really wanted to approach documentation in this way was to make room for ways of thinking about and understanding language that aren't just sort of these Western or European or academic ways of understanding how people use language. Um, it was about making space to record what language means to different people and how it shows up in their everyday lives, in their social worlds, in their ways of understanding the world. And so this is sort of how the field of sociolinguistic documentation officially came into being. And this is, again, a really, really, really big topic. So we're just going to get some little samples today. And we're going to focus on three sort of sub areas of sociolinguistic documentation. The first is multilingualism. This is probably something that might be familiar to a lot of you. I bet many of you here today are multilingual. Uh, so this is essentially what languages people speak and how they use them uh, in their lives. Another thing that you might look at in sociolinguistic documentation is variation. And this is a really big and well-established area of sociolinguistics, but there's not as much being done to document variation within sort of the language documentation field yet. I hope many of you will go change that. But variation is basically looking at differences in how different individual people or groups of people speak a language. Again, however we want to define a language. For the linguists here, you know that gets tricky. And a third thing that you can look at as part of sociolinguistic documentation are language attitudes and ideologies. And this, again, is just a technical term for what people believe and think and feel about language in general as a concept and specific languages or specific ways of talking. All right, so let's start with multilingualism. 
Uh, this is a, a pretty familiar one, again, to most of you. This is the study of what languages are used by individual people or communities and how those languages are used. And so this includes questions like, what languages does this person know? How did they learn those, right? Did they learn this language as a kid? Did they learn it in school? Did they learn it from their friends? Did they learn it from a spouse? How does this person use their languages? Do they use one of them every day? Do they use one of them kind of rarely? Do they use one for this purpose? Another interesting question that comes up a lot, especially in language endangerment contexts, is if two people with different mother tongues, right? That's a that's a phrase that can have very different meanings in different places. But if two people with different mother tongues or first languages or primary languages, if they meet, what language or languages are they going to use together? And what shapes that choice? And this ties into the question of what social roles does each language fill? If there are a bunch of languages in use in a community or by one person, what does that language, what does each of those languages mean to those people in a, in a social sense? And beyond just social meaning, what emotional and psychological and even spiritual meaning do different languages have within a community? And these are big, big questions. And so the way that we document them, there can be a lot of nuance and there can be a lot of different ways of approaching these questions. So just for a concrete example, uh, in my PhD research, I wanted to learn about the linguistic ecology, you know, that is all of the languages present and how they relate to each other and how people use them. I wanted to look at the linguistic ecology in one specific town, right? Even one town is a very large question to ask. So I wanted to keep it small. And the point of understanding that linguistic ecology for me was having a better understanding of why one of those languages, Yasa, was experiencing endangerment. Uh, and if you want to learn more about that, I link to some slides there. But this involved finding out what are all the languages spoken in this one town? And who speaks them? Who knows them? Who's learning them? How are each of these languages used, right? Are there specific languages that are mostly used at the market? Are there languages used when you're buying phone credit? Are there languages used when you're sound, sound, trying to sound really serious or authoritative? Or if you're trying to like be funny or casual, right? There are so many ways that people choose to use the languages they know. I wanted to know more about that. A uh, little, little fun fact, so you probably know the term domains of use, but sort of the situations and the parts of your life that you use a specific language in are called the domains of use for that language. Um, this is a popular but not totally bulletproof sociolinguistic concept. So I'm curious if in your own life, in your own communities, you can identify some languages that are used in specific places or situations or um, sort of social contexts. Like this one is really serious and this one's kind of more informal. Please drop them in the chat if you can think of examples from your own life. And I'm really curious for all of you as well, what is multilingualism like where you are, right? I'm sure lots of you know many languages. Uh, lots of you probably use multiple languages every day. So how do you use your own linguistic repertoire, your own set of languages that you have? Uh, and is your set of languages very different from the people around you? Um, what languages do your friends and family know and use? And if you want to get really deep thinking about it, think about what roles those languages play in your life, right? Maybe there's one language that's for education and government and formality, but maybe your home language is for fun and warmth and closeness to your friends and family. Or even if you go to the store, if you go to the market, what languages can you use? What will happen if you use other languages? And I see a question in the chat. It looks pretty detailed, so I'm going to come back to it at the very end, if that's okay. But if you have other questions related to stuff we're talking about right now, feel free to drop them in the chat. So if we kind of get more small scale than multilingualism, right, which is looking at all the different languages in a space, we can also narrow down to differences in how people or groups speak 
a language. Again, however we're defining a language, let's just roll with it. Variation looks at sort of those smaller differences within a language. And it's the study, let's, let's sound really smart. It's the study of how different people talk different. They do. So this is how we look at that uh, in, in the field of sociolinguistics. So for those of you in the US, this may not really resonate for folks outside the US, but I want you to compare these two sentences. One is sort of how maybe folks from my family might say it. They might say, I'm fixing to wash my car or yonder in the holler. Or somebody else might say, I'm preparing to go wash my car over there in the valley. What do you infer about the differences in these sentences? Like, how do you perceive the people who would say each of those things? How do you think those people might be different? I'll, I'll just wait for some answers in the chat. What is, what is the difference between the people who might say one or the other of those sentences? And just for reference, if you, if you don't understand the first one, it means the exact same thing as the second one in terms of literal meaning. It's just a different way of saying it. I'm hearing educated versus uneducated varieties. Yeah, how else do you perceive those people? I think actually we don't have a ton of folks from the US in the webinars this year, so this may not work very well, but yeah. You're living in different localities? Yeah, great guess. I think both of those are true. Both of those are pretty true. Um, so I'll just sort of explain how these might come across to somebody from the US. So the first one, like you said, uh, is roughly speaking, could be called Appalachian English. Yeah, another one, different social settings, variation in pronunciation, different social classes. Yeah, the second, first is among close relations. The second is more formal. These are all really perceptive suggestions. Nice job, guys. Yeah. So there are a lot of different ways to answer this within the US, but I think the first one, a lot of people would first hit on that uneducated versus, versus educated difference, right? The first sentence is a regional way of talking. Um, from a region called the Appalachian Mountains, where my dad's family is from, where there's a lot of social stigma about that region of the country. Uh, people are perceived as less educated, less smart, maybe more poor, right? There's a lot of negative stereotypes about that region. And so when people hear a sentence associated with the English of that region, all these other ideas about that person sort of click into their brain. And this is how all of our brains work, right? We all have these clusters of perceptions about different social categories. And so this, this example that is actually sort of a regional variety also sort of sparks perceptions of people who talk that way that aren't necessarily about where they're from. Yeah. Yes, indeed. I'm seeing lots of, lots of perceptive stuff in the chat. I'm seeing environmental and personal factors are a difference. Appalachia, there are beliefs about the people of that region and their socioeconomic status. Yep. Uh, oh, I see a guess about immigrant communities altering English. Yeah, if we go back many centuries, yes, the, the immigrants to Appalachia definitely shaped how that region spoke. But yeah, this is essentially one of those examples of how regional varieties carry a lot of other social meaning and a lot of stereotypes and beliefs about people from specific places. Yeah. Um, and so let's try another one. Again, this might just work for people in the US, but I bet a lot of you can kind of guess. What do you think is the difference between these three sentences? Would you grab me a pop? Would you grab me a soda? And would you grab me a Coke? Do any of these sound more natural to you? Do they sound more correct to you? And what do you think is the difference between these three sentences? Oh. You have a guess that is soda is California. Great guess, yep. Oh, and you see Coke as a brand. Yeah, I think a lot of people in a lot of parts of the US and probably also Canada hear Coke and they think like the brand name Coca-Cola. Yeah. And again, I, I wonder what 
words people in other countries use for this type of beverage. Uh, oh, I see another suggestion. They're all correct, only they're a Klein from informal to formal. Oh, interesting. Yeah, in the US, as far as I know, there is no sort of formality difference between these three variants. Um, these all refer to sort of those carbonated sugary beverages uh, that you might call a soft drink or a pop or a soda, right? A cold, a cold drink, I think, yeah. Uh, some, some places I think call them juice. We don't call them juice, but anything with carbonation that's really sweet. These are the words that we use in the U.S. And they all mean the same thing, but the main difference is regional. You can assume things about people who say these things, like where are they from? So if you hear someone from the US say pop, you kind of can guess which part of the US they're from. Uh, and this is a very famous sort of sociolinguistic dialect of English study. So you can read that paper linked here. Uh, oh, interesting. I'm seeing that in Nigeria, soda is also a brand. Oh, okay. So there's a brand called soda. Yeah, but in the US specifically, this is sort of one of the classic Coke, pop, soda maps. Uh, and so everything red circled is where they say Coke as the generic for any kind of soft drink. And you'll notice that this is most of the US South where Coke doesn't necessarily mean Coca-Cola, right? You could order an orange Fanta and call it a Coke, right? Like when I go down South uh, for the holidays and I say, can I have a Coke in a restaurant? The waiter will usually ask what kind, because it could mean any kind of soft drink. But if you look at the blue areas, I think somebody said soda is California. So you are largely correct there. Um, soda is sort of an East Coast and West Coast thing. Uh, so that's the word for any generic soft drink on sort of the coasts. Uh, oops, sorry. And then pop is really popular sort of up in the north of the US and southern Canada. I'm also really curious for anybody from northern Canada, what do y'all say for this type of beverage? But you'll also notice there are some little pockets of other colors, right? We have these purple dots here and kind of down here where people say tonic, a totally different word. Um, Oh, I'm seeing that in Northern Canada, they say pop. All right, so the pop sort of continues up North. And I think another really important thing about this map, I agree, I agree, Michael, it is a beautiful map, so much interesting knowledge in it. Um, you'll see that these general outlines are just patterns, because if you look within the quote unquote pop area, you'll also see people who say Coke, you'll see people who say soda, same thing in the Coke area, you'll see people who say pop. And so this is a really good reminder that if we look at sociolinguistic patterns, they're almost never like 100% accurate. They're not a hard and fast rule. They are just patterns that show sort of general trends in how things work. And so, you know, if you happened to be down in the south of the US and you heard somebody say pop, they're not wrong. They're just slightly different from the prevailing pattern. It doesn't mean they're not actually speaking Southern English. And this is just one pretty basic example of how really small differences in speech, right? Just one word you choose to use when you're ordering a beverage um, can carry a lot of social meaning. Right, so when we had the Appalachian English sentence, yeah, it was pretty different from sort of the mainstream English, but it told us where the person was from, but it also told us lots of other stuff that we might assume about like their socioeconomic status or their education level or whatever. And so we can look at variation in the words we use, right? This Coke soda pop thing, for example, it's called lexical variation. We can look at the way we pronounce things, right? If the difference between somebody's ordering a pop and ordering a pap, if you hear that vowel difference, that can tell you a lot about sort of which part of the pop area of the US they're from. Uh, you can look at differences in people's grammar, right? Like, can you say it needs washed in your kind of English? For me, it, I'm like, oh, no, I can't say that. I have to say it needs to be washed. But a lot of people from sort of the Midwest US 
can totally say it needs washed. That sounds totally normal to them. And there are a lot of other differences in how we talk that we can look at if we're interested in sociolinguistic documentation. And each of these kinds of differences can relate to and shape our perceptions of somebody's age, right? You might hear a word or a pronunciation and think, ooh, that sounds really young. Like that's how the kids say it. Uh, it can relate to their gender, right? In some languages, in some communities, there are like really strong differences between how men and women speak. It can also tell you where somebody is from or where they live or maybe where they affiliate themselves with in the world. It can tell you even stuff about kind of what they think and what they believe, right? There are things called religiolects, which are special ways of speaking specific to religious groups. It can also tell you about somebody's political beliefs. Uh, there was a very famous study in the US in the, I think in the late 2000s, showing that uh, people on in either one of our political parties said the name of the country Iraq very differently, right? Whether you said Iraq or Iraq basically could tell your listener which political party you belonged to. Uh, it can also tell us something about people's socioeconomic class, their social identities, right? Whether you think you're like a cool tough guy or a nerd or whatever sort of individual social identity you want to put across. And so much more. I'm sure y'all can think of other ways that language shapes your perception of people. And if there are other categories you're thinking of, other social identities that you perceive in how people talk, put them in the chat. I so want to hear about them. And then if we zoom way on out and we start thinking about people's beliefs and feelings around language, their thoughts about what is good language, how should you talk, what's a real language, um, which languages they like, which languages they don't like, all of these things can kind of be grouped together under the heading language attitudes and ideologies. And this is a very strong example of a language ideology in action uh, on the University of Boya campus in Cameroon. It says pidgin, that is Cameroonian pidgin English, which is a Creole language. Pidgin is a lingua franca good only for non-academic environments. Do not use it on campus by order. So this is a rule that is giving you really specific language ideologies, right? It's telling you what pigeon is and where it's allowed to be used and what it's good for. This is very rarely will you see a language ideology expressed so clearly. Usually you have to kind of dig a little deeper to get at them. But if you go to the University of Boya campus, you will see tons of signs like this that have very clear language ideologies. And so many things fall under this general category of attitudes and ideologies, but some of the really common questions people like to look at are uh, people's beliefs about whether multilingualism is a strength or a weakness, right? Are people saying it's great if you know five languages or are they saying we should all only speak one language? Um, you also might look at whether people think specific languages are better or more beautiful you can also often find a lot of really interesting beliefs around who should speak a language, who is allowed to speak a language, and who counts as a good speaker or a real speaker. This is one of my favorite uh, research topics myself. There's also really sort of broad questions about what language is, what it is sort of uh, in a I want to say in an epistemological way, but let's let me try and phrase it as like. Uh, what do you believe that language is in its essence? Is it alive? Does it have a spirit? Is it a series of chemicals in your brain? Is it a social behavior, right? What is language and, and how does it work? Um, and also this these questions around social identity and language. So does being a real something require you to speak something, right? Um, like in my own research, I've heard from many people that if you are a real IASA person, you must speak IASA. And if you don't know IASA, you're not a real IASA person, right? Are there beliefs like that in your community and, and how do they show up in life? 
So let's, let's do a little bit of concrete thought. These are all very cool abstract questions, but it's a little overwhelming to just think like, oh God, how do I document this? Do I just ask people? Let's look at some methods we might use. So documenting multilingualism, number one, I think it's really fun and cool. It's just me editorializing. But depending on what you wanna look at, a first step you might wanna take is just observing. Um, so just go hang out in public places, right? Sit in a market, um, hang out at an outdoor cafe, walk around a neighborhood and look and listen and see what languages you're hearing around you, what languages you're seeing written on signs, on buses and graffiti. Are you hearing people switching between languages and who is actually using which languages, right? Are there different languages on the signs of certain kinds of stores and how do those patterns play out? And are you noticing that some languages are used for specific things, right? Are you seeing one language all over storefronts, but it's totally different than the language that most people seem to be speaking? Or are you hearing official announcements in one language, but you're hearing people greeting their friends in a different language? Start looking for, for patterns like that. And maybe even write down what you're noticing. But, you know, depending on where you are, depending on your own context, be a little bit cautious about just recording strangers in public, especially if you're planning to write this up for any type of university affiliated research. So maybe if you're with a university, check your university ethics office. If you're not working within a university, um, you check your understanding of your local laws and ethics and community norms about whether it's cool to record strangers in public. Be very cautious about that. I see another question in the chat, but again, kind of complex. So we're going to go through this section and see if you have a follow-up question, Michael. Um, another thing that you can use to document multilingualism, maybe after you've done some basic observation, are surveys. So surveys are basically when you ask the same set of questions over and over to a bunch of different people. You've probably all taken surveys before, um, but these are great when you have a specific goal, right? When there is a specific thing you want to find out. They're not as good for generally exploring uh, a context you're unfamiliar with. So it helps if you have a little bit of knowledge about the community you're working in, especially if it's not your own community, and kind of what languages are present there. And written surveys and oral surveys are both totally fine options, right? It depends on, you know, what languages people can read in, whether people are really comfortable engaging with written surveys, um, whether you want to use the, the verbal interviews and surveys to kind of foster relationships, right? Just think about which one what might work best for you. Written surveys, it's usually easier to send it out to a large, large number of people, but you also don't get as rich or nuanced information if people are just checking yes or no or writing down a list of languages, right? So, Moving beyond multilingualism, and if you have more questions about documenting multilingualism or how to do it, I will totally come back to those. Uh, but let's think about how to document variation. That is the differences in how different people use a language. Uh, so this is a really cool and very challenging topic to look at. But in the last, I don't know, five or 10 years, more and more people are starting to do a lot of really cool and interesting work in this field. So if you get interested in it, there's a really rich and exciting body of research that's starting to happen around this. So your first challenge when you're documenting variation is going to be to figure out what you want to look at, right? Um, so for example, if you're working in a language community that you know well, have you ever noticed something like this pop soda coke thing in your own community? Is there a word that different age groups or different genders or different villages say differently. Or maybe there's a difference in pronunciation, right? You think to yourself, oh man, if someone said it like that, I would know what town they're from, right? So think about what resonates immediately that you can identify as one of these sociolinguistic differences. If 
nothing comes to mind. Maybe you're working in a community that you don't know that well, or you don't know the language super well. You might also just do some more observation and listening. Um, listen to what people tell you. As soon as, in a lot of cases, like when I was doing my own PhD work, I became known as that nerd who's really interested in language. And so people would just come up to me and be like, hey, did you know this about language? And I'd be like, wow, thanks for telling me. That's so interesting. So if you gain a reputation as someone really interested in language, people might just tell you things like, oh yeah, young people say this thing, but older people say this thing. They might even say it in sort of a complaining way, like, ugh, young people say it wrong and they say it like this. So just always be listening out and inviting people to tell you their own observations about language. And through all of these sort of observations and thinking, you might identify a variable. So the variable is the specific thing that's different from person to person or from group to group. And that's where you can really jump into looking at how that variable is different across people. And there are some concrete tools you can use when you're looking at how maybe the pronunciation of a word is different across people or which word people use. So some really classic and easy to use tools are describing a silent movie or a picture book with no words in it. Linguists love this because it's a way to get people to talk about basically the same thing without also telling them what to say or prompting them by playing or writing down words for them. So for example, if you're curious about this Coke soda pop distinction, uh, you might just like film a short movie on your phone of somebody sitting down and pouring a glass of, is it Coke, is it soda, is it pop, who knows? So you could just play that little silent video to somebody and say, tell me what's happening in this video. And the person will probably say something like, oh, they poured a glass of pop or they poured a glass of Coke and voila, you've got your variable. Another thing you can do is ask folks to read out loud or translate a word list so you can see if different people pronounce the same word in different ways. And I'm seeing in the, in the chat, we used the pair story film yeah, that's a really popular one. Tons of people use that movie. It's a short movie about a dude picking pears and some of the pears fall out of the basket and lots of other things happen. Yeah. You can also, if you want to go sort of more in depth, you can record interviews or conversations between people, again, with their permission, and listen to see if they use that word or that uh grammatical difference that you're looking for and just see how it comes out in sort of normal, quote unquote, natural speech. See if you can notice people talking the way you're looking for. So again, just a concrete example. Uh, there was a study I did back in 2015 where I was talking with people who spoke Mzumba uh, in a village called Bangulap in Cameroon. And these were people of all different ages and genders. I I did that on purpose. I wanted to know about how different ages and genders of people talked. And I asked each person to describe a set of drawings like these. And these are called the Bowerman Peterson uh, something something stimuli. I'll put them in the Google Drive folder. Uh, but these are just little line drawings that show objects kind of next to or on top of or under or inside each other. And basically, I would just say like, here is a dog. Where is the dog for this picture? And people would usually say something like, oh, it's outside its house, or it's next to its house, or it's sitting on the ground. Uh, but people would generally use really similar words. So for this picture on the right, I would say, where's the hat? And almost everybody would basically say, it's on his head. It's on the guy's head. It's on a man's head. And as I was listening back to all of these interviews I recorded with people saying it's on the guy's head, I noticed something about how they were saying the word head in Majumba. So the head, the word head, the way I learned it is chu with a ch sound, right? But I noticed that people weren't always saying chu. Some people would say tu. Some people would say, I'm not very good at aspiration contrast, but some people would say do. Some people would say tu with a really strong H. Some people would say su 
with like a T-S T -S sound. And then some people would say it the way I learned it, choo. But not everybody used even the same word for head. And these were all people in the exact same village and it's not a very big village. So I thought, what is going on here? That's really cool. And so I started looking at the patterns and who said what. And it turns out there was a pretty clear set of patterns and who was saying each of these variables. So do was mostly said by older men, not entirely. There were some older women and younger men who said do, but mostly it was older men. And then two with the aspiration was mostly being said by older men and older women. So kind of just like the older generation variable. And then su was mostly said by younger men. So it's kind of like the young dudes pronunciation. And then chu was mostly said by young people in general, but especially younger women. And so I thought that was super interesting. And it ties into some other bigger sociolinguistic theories about young women being the ones who drive language change. Too big to get into right now. But it was really cool to see this actual pattern in a small village between how people of different ages and genders said this one really basic common word, head. So I'll drop a link to that study in our materials folder if you want to see another example of how people look at variation. And then of course also, for whoever said this was a beautiful map of the soda pop coke, you can make maps like that too. It's totally doable. Uh, it's You don't even need very fancy equipment these days. If you have just a computer, you can do it. So if you are able to travel, you can go to different parts of a region and ask people to read a word list or describe a silent movie. You can also ask people from different areas. Maybe if you live in a big city, you can ask people where they grew up, where they've lived, um, and ask them to pronounce a certain word and see if there are differences and kind of map out like, oh, a person from this city says this and a person from this city says this. And it's always good to ask people, again, get as much information as folks are comfortable sharing about where they grew up, what languages they know, just so you can start piecing together more nuance of those patterns of how people talk. A cool example is the Linguistic Atlas and Survey of Irish Dialects published in the 1950s, so it's quite old now, but it's a map that shows how people in each different part of Ireland say a bunch of different words or phrases, right? So this is a whole map that if you go to this village, you might hear this. If you go to this town, you might hear this. And... Uh, one of last year's interns at ELP, Joe Simpson, is actually working on a graduate project to update that atlas uh, because things have obviously changed a lot since the 1950s. He's gathering a bunch of different recordings of Irish speakers from all over Ireland and updating that map. So you could totally do something like that. And this is, again, a really cool and interesting um, topic but it's also complicated. So please feel free to write to me if you'd like to learn more. Uh, my PhD advisor, Katie Drager, actually wrote a whole handbook just basically for students who want to learn more about how to do this kind of research. All right, I will try to speed it up a little because we don't have that much time left. Sorry, guys, I love talking about this stuff. So how do we document language attitudes and ideologies? Uh, number one, it's really hard and it's really complex. and you'll never arrive at a single correct answer. I'll just say that. And that's fine and that's awesome because there are so many different ways of understanding and looking at people's beliefs and ideas and thoughts. Uh, and this is one where it's a lot harder to just kind of use tools like a silent film or a word list or whatever. This is one where you have to get a little bit more qualitative a lot of the time. So yes, you can do a survey about language attitudes, but it's often just a start. So first thing and last thing and everything, honestly, is observing, right? Look at the people in your community, listen to what they say, see what they post on Facebook, right? And sometimes language attitudes and ideologies show up very explicitly right on the surface in things like scolding or praising. Do they make fun of a celebrity if they say a certain thing or speak a certain language? If you wanna really get into it, you can look at the Facebook comments on news stories around language and boy, people will definitely show their language ideologies there. 
Um, and maybe you'll even see something as blatant as a sign on your local university campus saying, do not speak this language on campus. Um, but another thing you can do beyond just what people say about language, look at how they say it. Listen to the arguments they use, listen to the reasons they give for saying you shouldn't use a language or you should use a language. And also look inside yourself, right? We all have language attitudes and ideologies. Nobody is attitude free. So reflect on your own beliefs about language. If you can, maybe write down a list of things that you believe about language, right? What do you think language is? Is it neurons in your brain? Is it a living thing? Is it a social tradition? Is it, is it connection to your land? What do you believe? And then write down maybe what you believe about other languages. Do you have one of those ideas like, oh, French is the most romantic language. See if you can just brainstorm a bunch of those beliefs in a few minutes. And if you have any that come to mind right now, again, put them in the chat. I am always interested to hear those. Uh, but beyond just kind of observing, interviews are a really good next step for exploring language attitudes. And there are lots of different ways to do these interviews. The way I like to approach it is a lot of open-ended questions that don't make people think you want a certain answer, right? If you say, do you think French is the most romantic language? Well, people really can just give you a yes or no, and they might kind of think that you want to hear yes, that maybe you love the French language and they don't want to offend you. So instead of asking that, you could ask something that's not a yes, no question, like what languages do you like to hear spoken? What makes you really happy to hear and why? Why do you, why do you like that language? Or this is a really interesting one in my experience. If you could pick one and only one language in the whole world for your kids to speak, what would it be and why? And well, people will have really interesting answers to that a lot of the time. And again, interviews are great because a lot of people love to talk about their own opinions. And it's really interesting. They will say really interesting things. And again, always listen for the way they phrase these answers. Because a lot of the, the framings and the reasonings that they give are just as interesting as the actual answers. Uh, yep, and if you wanna read a bunch of stuff about language ideologies in one community, you can check out my dissertation, but it also has an interview template sample that I used, um, might give you some ideas for interview questions you could ask as well. But at the end of the day, overall, sociolinguistic documentation is about looking at relationships, right? Relationships between people, between communities, between languages, and the relationships between places and ideas and histories. It gets really juicy and complicated. And this always means, I'm going to say this like every session I lead, that your own relationships with the community that you're working in and the people that you're working with are going to be really important to this work. The more familiarity and knowledge and closeness you have with the language community that you're studying or working with, the more you're going to be able to find out. So take extra time if you're doing this kind of work to just hang out, to get to know people, to build relationships, make friends, spend time in public places, strike up conversations with folks in the market or on the bus or whatever, and just listen and watch and listen and talk to folks. And if, like me, you might be a graduate student feeling pressured for time to gather enough information for your research, you might feel like you're wasting time. But I promise, none of that is wasting time. All of that is a really important part of the work of any kind of sociolinguistics, any kind of language documentation, but especially for sociolinguistic documentation. You're never wasting time just getting to know people and learn more about the community you're in. And finally, like, what's the point? Why would we do this kind of sociolinguistic documentation other than it's really cool and interesting if you're a language nerd? Well, it actually has a lot of applications too. There are a lot of practical things you can do with this kind of knowledge. So number one, knowing about multilingualism in a community is super important for knowing what information to provide crucial services in, right? So like back at the start of COVID, 
it was really hard to know what languages to send information out in because not everybody knew what languages were in use in specific communities and everybody needed basic safety information. Uh, so having a good idea of the multilingualism in a community is really important just for keeping people safe and healthy in a lot of circumstances. Similarly, it's also really, really important for language revitalization, right? If you wanted to, des to design a good revitalization program, it really helps to know what other languages people are using and importantly, what they believe about language, how they see language, what they think about language, right? If they're of the opinion that only older people are good speakers of the language and you set up a program where somebody really young is teaching, you might run into some obstacles because people's beliefs, people's ideologies are not matching the revitalization program you're setting up. Uh, another thing that this kind of work can be useful for is helping to create awareness of, and in many cases, acceptance of variation, right? So if we go back to that Appalachian English example, if anybody in my family were to go to like a formal university classroom and speak Appalachian English, they might be perceived as like less intelligent, even if they were super smart. And so sometimes it really helps to create public learning materials that say, look, different people talk in different ways and that's okay. It's not wrong if you speak differently from the standard. I think I saw a very perceptive comment in the chat about uh, language intersecting with superiority and uh, dominance. And let's come back to that because absolutely, right? Creating awareness and acceptance of variation can kind of help combat stigma and negative stereotypes about people who speak a certain way uh, just by showing like, look, the people speak all these different ways. Let's not put any of them down. And finally, doing sociolinguistic documentation is really helpful for making learning and reference materials for your languages. So if let's say there are 10 different ways that people pronounce the word head and somebody's trying to learn your language and they look at a dictionary and they just see chu and they have no idea that people also say tu and tu and su, if they go out there and try and talk to folks in Majumba and somebody says su, they're gonna be like, oh God, I don't know what that means. But if your dictionary actually says that the word head can be pronounced in all these different ways, then your learners are better equipped to learn sort of the full richness of your language. Okay, that was a mouthful. That was a bunch of stuff and I went a little long, sorry. So let's have some questions. I'm gonna go back to some of the earlier questions in here in the chat, but feel free to add some others or raise your hand if you wanna ask questions out loud. So I see a question from Vicente, how do we manage language hegemony? We cannot avoid hegemony in a multilingual society. There is one strong and pervasive language to emerge out of many languages in a multilingual society. So this is a very rich question, Vicente. So first you're saying, how do we manage it? Because it's inevitable, right? You're saying we cannot avoid a situation where one language kind of rises to the top and dominates all the other languages. And this was actually a really common belief in a lot of kinds of linguistics for the last several decades. Uh, but that belief was mostly based on looking at uh, largely European or European settled societies uh, or other sort of really large dominant types of cultures in the world. But in the last couple of decades and for much longer back in linguistic anthropology, there have been lots and lots of studies that show that's not always the case. There are multilingual contexts where one language is not obviously at the top, um, where this idea that for lack of a better term, one is like winning out over the others, that doesn't always happen. There are communities and places where a very stable, what they call egalitarian small scale multilingualism persists for generations, for centuries, where a bunch of different languages coexist in different contexts with different roles, but without like strong power relations between them. And so we can manage language hegemony when it shows up, right? There are lots of different ways we can do this through policy, through sort of personal language practices, but 
there actually does not have to be language hegemony in a multilingual society. There are lots of cases where there isn't. Uh, and I'll try to remember to put some cool readings about that in the chat. Yeah. Let's see. I'm seeing a lot of thoughts about soda and pop and Coke and what everybody's regional varieties say. I love that. Thank you. Um, I also see that Nigerian Pidgin English is widely accepted as having no restrictions and could be used as a language of instruction. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's that's cool. I think Nigerian Pidgin English is slightly more accepted in many Nigerian contexts than in Cameroonian contexts, but please correct me if I'm wrong. I'm definitely no expert there. So I am going to go back to Michael's questions about what instruments can we use for sociolinguistic documentation. I gave a few examples there. Michael, let me know if there's some other type of research question you're specifically trying to look at um, and you, you're not finding a good tool or an instrument to look at that. And then Ritsung notes that language intersects with the status of superiority, dominance, identity, and ideologies too. So will sticking to a particular format be the way or what is the most time-tested way to document a language or languages? Wow, this is a brilliant and very complex question because you're touching on a lot of fundamental issues in language documentation, right? Even the, the update to our definition of language documentation that I started with here, that's grounded in some very strong ideologies about superiority and identity and uh, whether one person has one language or not, right? And so when you ask about what are the most time-tested ways to document a language, well, first, this field of language documentation is quite young in its current iteration, right? The way we do language documentation now really only started in the 1990s, uh, 1980s if you push it way back, but really the 90s. Um, I think most people would put that, that cutoff point firmly in the mid to late 1990s. So time-tested, we're still really early in this field. But that said, even the ways that we've been doing things for the last 20 or 30 years in language documentation come from a lot of other very deeply rooted ideologies about language and knowledge and research that are mostly from the Western Academy, from sort of the ways that European and European settler societies have conceived of research and knowledge and language for the last many centuries. Um, so <laughs> that's a long-winded way of saying the way we do things now is not ideology free. There are a lot of really great papers and talks you can learn from on this topic. And um, I would encourage all of you to think outside of sort of the, the quote unquote best practices, right? These are just the, the ways that are normalized in doing things in language documentation. That doesn't mean they're the best ways or the only ways. They're just kind of the main ways anyone has been doing things. But there are tons of other ways that are grounded in other ideologies, other understandings of language that are emerging and will continue to emerge. And so keep going outside the box. Don't keep going beyond what I'm telling you here. If you think of a better way to do things that more accurate, accurately reflects your understanding of language, do that and tell me about it because I want to learn all about it if you're willing to share. Sorry, Ria Tung, that was a very long answer and I'm not really sure I got at your question, so feel free to follow up. Um, let's see. So Michael asks, what sampling procedure is appropriate for sociolinguistic documentation? And for interviews, do we have a saturation point, e.g. number of hours? Great question. I, I love these, these questions that are like, how do I know when I'm done? How do I know when I have enough? And I hate to tell you, there's really no, there's no answer to when are you done? When do you have enough information? Uh, in most cases, it's how much time do you have? How soon is your research report due? How much funding do you have? What can you practically accomplish? Um, so I don't think there is a saturation point for interviews. I've done studies where it was like, I talked to literally five people and that was the whole study. I talked to each of them for a couple hours and that was that. And there was so much in just talking to those five people that you could write something about it. I've done other studies where I talked to like 70 people for a really long time. And 
there was a lot there. And I think it just depends on how much time you have and what questions you're trying to ask. Uh, and then what sampling procedure is appropriate for sociolinguistic documentation? This is another question where it totally depends on what you're trying to find out, right? So if you're looking at, let's say your research question is, uh, how do young men and women talk differently when they are playing chess at my local high school? Then your sampling procedure is really gonna be about getting a roughly equal number of young men and young women who play chess at your local high school. And whether that's like 50 boys and 50 girls or like two boys and two girls, again, depends on how much time and how much resources you have. Uh, but always just sort of design your group of folks you talk to around the questions you're asking, right? The procedures you use are always gonna grow out of what you wanna find out. Let's see, what kind of software can we use to do a map of linguistic variation? Uh, great question. So you can use Google Maps, honestly. Uh, there's no reason you can't just create a, a Google Map of like, here's where I heard people say Coke and here's where I heard people say Pop. Uh, people also use more complex softwares like ArcGIS if you want to make something really pretty. There are lots of other mapping softwares out there like Mapbox now that are very user friendly. I actually have a colleague who teaches an online course in using uh, geographic information systems for indigenous advocacy, but she's a linguist by background. So I will try and pull up a link to that course and share it with y'all if you're really interested in mapping stuff. Let's see, I see a question. Is a Swadesh list a good compilation to start documenting from? Yeah, that's a great, like very straightforward tool to use when you're starting documentation. Um, for anybody who doesn't know, a Swadesh list is named after this early linguist named Morris Swadesh. It's a list of, um, there are longer and shorter versions. The normal one's about a hundred words long. And it's supposed to be words that everybody in every culture has like human body parts, things like fire and ashes and water and just like stuff that everybody in the whole world would probably have a word for. And that can be a great place to start, especially if you want to look at differences in pronunciation, right? Because you're getting the same words over and over from each person you talk to. And you can listen carefully to how they pronounce each of those same words. So yeah, Swadesh list is often very useful. Uh, let's see, what is the best instrument to know variations of voice? For example, active and passive voice. Oh, Lord. Um, there are a lot of very specialized um, sort of elicitation tool kits from the Max Planck Institute. Um, let's see if I can pull those up. But they have tons and tons of stuff like that if you're looking at very specific um, typological questions. All right. Here you go. Here's a great resource for all y'all if you're looking at sort of the, the nitty gritty linguisty uh, syntax questions. Um, I see another comment. I took a very old document that taught phrases and made it interactive with QR codes, then broke the words into syllables. Awesome. Yeah, that sounds like a really cool teaching tool. QR codes are being used in a lot of language projects just because they're easy to generate. Basically, everybody has their phone on them all the time. And it's a really cheap and quick way to get people access to video or audio without having to like set up a speaker somewhere. So cool idea. Uh, I see a question from Wera. Is it possible to make sociolinguistic documentation of extinct languages? I mean, the culture and the descendants still remain. Ooh, that's a complex question. Yeah, so documentation, the way linguists often say it, is very hard to do if there's nobody who still uses the language. What you would be doing is consulting past documentation rather than generating new documentation because you don't have anyone to, to talk to or, or make records with um, if no one's still using the language. But the question of, is it possible to sort of look at the sociolinguistics of languages that aren't in use anymore? The answer is totally, uh, especially if, like you said, there are still descendants who identify with the language, who maybe remember their parents or grandparents using the language. 
there are really interesting and fruitful questions you can ask. Like, do you remember your grandma speaking more than one language, right? Do you remember what language she would use with her friends? Or, you know, when you were growing up, what did the old folks talk when they went to the market? You can totally ask questions like that and start sketching out a picture of some of these sociolinguistic things in the past when folks were using the language actively. And that can be really, really helpful in revitalization too, right? And sort of thinking, okay, how did people do things before and how might we take that into account for new speakers? Um, yeah, and then there also is a lot of sort of historical sociolinguistics research that falls outside of my, my area of knowledge, but it does exist. And if you look up basically historical sociolinguistics, you'll find a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, let's see, question about instruments. What language, attitudes, and ideologies survey questionnaires can you recommend? Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, I don't know if there are any really good one-size-fits-all questionnaires because language attitudes and ideologies are very local, right? They, they are often very specific to a community or a place or a context. Um, and I think the best thing to do in most cases is take inspiration from other people's questionnaires that they use, but write your own and collaborate with people in the community to see if the questions make sense, if they're questions that you know people could actually answer. I think I, I wrote four or five drafts of my interview template um, and then just sort of talked it over with different people in the community and revised the questions and changed them to make sense locally. So I don't know if I can recommend just a, a template to use. Um, it, it usually goes best to kind of make your own based on what you know about the, the community. Let's see, I see a question from Floris. In the case of language variation, like in Batanga, we have two dialects, Bapuku and Banol. Must I choose one variety to do the documentation or I must record the two varieties? Well, honestly, again, that's up to you and how much time you have and sort of the scope of your research interest. You don't have to do anything really in language documentation other than like act ethically. Um, if you are really interested in just one of the dialects, you can focus your documentation and just say, look, this is my documentation of Bapuku. You could even focus really small and say like, I'm documenting Bapuku as it is spoken in this quartier of Kribi, right? It doesn't even have to be everywhere. It could just be like in one neighborhood. Or you could get big and you could say, I'm going to document the differences in these dialects uh, across a bunch of different towns. It's up to you and how much time you have and kind of how much interest you have in both dialects. Um, and let's see. See, one more question. I just want to make sure about instruments. We adapted a language attitude survey adapt used in a Native American language context. And I'm assuming you're talking about using that in the Philippines. And that's super interesting. I'd be curious to hear how that went, right? If you used that survey, did anyone respond? Like, I don't know what that question means or that doesn't really make sense to me. Or maybe they understood questions about like a, a North American language context in a way that you didn't expect. Uh, I'd love to hear how that went <laughs> and yeah, and, and kind of what kind of answers you got. And yeah, and it looks like we had to rewrite some items. Not super surprising. You probably got much more nuanced and rich answers um, when you adapted them to, to local contexts. Um, all right, I'll give it a minute for any other questions, but I think that's all I see. I'm sorry if I missed any of those. And so while I'm waiting for other questions, I'll see if I can find that uh, GIS training link for y'all. Because that is a super useful skill to have, just kind of uh, how to make good maps. It can be useful for a lot of different purposes. All right, let me see. I should post about it on LinkedIn. So here I am admitting that I'm looking at LinkedIn. Ugh. Uh, just checking back for other questions. Nope, no other questions yet. So I am still going to try and find you this GIS training. 
And again, GIS basically just means geographical information systems. Sorry, still looking. And if I can't find it right now, it won't make you watch me search forever. I will just send it out after the session. Oh, found it. All right. So this is a certificate course. Oh, nope. All right. The deadline has passed. So I'm going to see if she's teaching it again, and I will send around a link uh, if it's coming up again. But there are also a lot of really cool open access courses that you can take just to sort of teach yourself as you go how to use GIS systems, not specifically for language, but in general. So there's a link to one of them. But okay, so uh, that's it. I've now kept you 11 minutes over time, so I appreciate everybody's time. Uh, and if you have any other questions about sociolinguistic documentation in general, just please feel free to send me an email. And we will see y'all next week. I hope everyone has a good weekend and uh, have a safe and healthy week ahead. All right. Take care. Oh, see one more. How is multilingual documentation different from a mere study that's not considered documentation? I don't think there is a difference. I think anytime you're looking at multilingualism, you're doing a form of documentation. So don't let anybody tell you you're not doing documentation. All right, y'all. Everybody be well, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, guys.